Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. Welcome back to the shop. Thank you to everybody that followed my advice on that other channel that I suggested the other day. Uh, it, it really made a difference. Thank you very much. Before I go any further on this little model with parts I actually have to machine, well, I mean, I guess you got to machine them all, right? I'm going to stick with the castings, and I'm going to continue with the actual table casting itself. And before I do, I made a couple of tweaks and changes to the knee and the lead screw. Only take a minute to review that. I put some bushings in there, put some bumpers in there, put some washers in there, put a little bit of this, a little bit of that in there. And it's pretty smooth. Let's take a look at that and we'll move on to the actual bed casting. Well, amazing things happen when you read notes on blueprints supplied to you by someone else. This particular lead screw needed to pass all the way through that gear and go all the way to the inside and bump up against the casting. That put the threaded section right at the end of the range of motion. That was observation number one. Observation or change number two is I took 20 thousandths of an inch off of each one of the rotating facial surfaces in here on the brass gears. And I made a 20 thou thick Celcon shims for it. I don't know if you can see them or not, but they're in there. So that the rotation is no longer brass on aluminum. There you go. No longer brass on aluminum. It's brass on the Celcon bushing. And the Celcon bushing rotates against the aluminum. So it is incredibly smooth. Now the shaft that comes in from the front will have a collar on it. So that it will not go all the way in. And the gap or the motion that you can see right there will not be present at assembly. That'll be adjusted out by the screw itself. We'll just push the lead screw in and choke up on the gear, taking the play out of it. That'll work. And as far as the shaft passing all the way through and bumping up against this, now let me take it off and I'll show you the cap that I made for that so that this doesn't ultimately drill its way through the top. The inside of that assembly now looks like that. That is actually just a Celcon cap pushed onto the end of the shaft. And as it rotates, it is plastic against the aluminum. Brass against plastic, plastic against the aluminum inside. And this thing is about glass smooth. It's absolutely beautiful. Takes the gear noise out of it. And that's, I'm not changing the sound here, guys. Listen to it. Love it. Okay, let's move on to another part. I would call this one a wrap. Quite pleased with the way that came out. Bed casting item number four. This is what it looks like when we start with it. Pretty clean casting. Looks like it's very well lined up as far as the... I mean, you could have two lemon slice shapes that are in different directions, but it looks like they got this one fairly true. And pretty much every surface on this thing gets machined, with the exception of these faces right here. But I might put that in the mill and just back bore that and make that nice and round. We'll have to see how that goes. Material does come off of all sides. Everything is going to be nice and true when it's done. So it's going to be relatively easy to hold. But you don't want to hold over dovetails. So that will probably be the last thing to do. The dovetail may cut into this boss on the end as well as this one. And if that does take place, well, then I'll trim them down so that you can't see any dig marks in it. At least superficially, that is the plan. Starting datum, this diameter right here, I'm going to go with the center line of this diameter on the end, and I will work up and down to establish not only the 375 height thickness of this. There's a center line dimension here, 94, so that makes it 281 from the top down. Make it 281 from the top down, and then I will make this 375 to suit the print. 500 on the width, everything is pretty straightforward. So let's clean this up with a file. Uh, initially cleaning up with a file, I'm just going to make sure that this back side is flat and I'm going to use that as my reference. So starting here, I'll mill a side, flip it, mill that side, flip it over again, dust these surfaces off because this is the bottom of the dovetail when it's done. That is an articulating surface and you do not want to cast articulating surface on a finished machine surface because, well, it's going to act like a file and tear it up. So if you have to dust that, go ahead and dust that. 
no big deal. All right, let's clean this thing up, square it up, get it going. After about five minutes with a reliably flat file, I've got the back surface cleaned up, which is going to be against the back stationary jaw of the vise, and I've got the bottom side cleaned up to the point where, you know, watch the watch as the casting marks go away, and you'll be able to tell how much of the material is being influenced and removed from which end and how consistently you're removing it. You can see that this piece was low in the middle, high on either end, and it's a very consistent, very flat surface. Now you sit it on top of your vise and give it one of these. And watch for it to make noise, tap, spin easily. If it spins easily, it's high in the middle. If it stalls out, then it's probably low in the middle. So look between whatever surface you have or put a piece of paper under there, feeler gauge, whatever, to determine what you got. If it is bowed and you squeeze it, you're going to straighten out the bow temporarily when you machine it and release it, that bow is going to return. So that's especially critical with the dovetail. At that time, you need to know that everything is going to be nice and true. So for the first couple of cuts, I'm going to hold it real gently. I'm going to put it in the vise stationary jaw. It's going to be registered here on a pin because this is a draft surface. Anytime you use a pin and a draft surface, make sure that the draft is downward towards you. That will force the pin back against the stationary jaw. If we were to flip this around and the draft is up, the pin could walk out. And as the part walks out or as the pin walks out, the part tangency will change. So keep that in mind, guys. You want the low side of the slope against the back jaw to form a locking feature when it comes down on the pin. Right, let's take it over the machine, stick it in there, dust this side, dust that side, and then I'll measure from the sides to the boss as soon as I remove those flashlights. And that will give me my amount of material I have to remove to center up on this boss and keep the width within tolerance. Let's do it.
Sometimes terminology can be a little confusing from one country to the next or maybe even across the same desk. So before I go any further, I want to make sure you know exactly what I'm talking about here. Bottom of the vise, stationary jaw. The setup that you just saw me use, I had a one, two, three block laying in here. I had a pin in here. And I'm going to draw this greatly exaggerated so I make my point. The draft on the part was this way. So if I said low side, in my mind, it is the low dimension, not the low side, not this side, okay? You want the wedge as such so that when you push down as this comes closed, the pin wants to migrate back and stays right in that triangle. Tangent here here and here. If you spin it around, it'll have a tendency to kick it out and the part is going to want to skew in the vise. So don't do that. Okay, just to make sure that everybody knows what I was talking about. That's what I did. That's what I meant. And regardless of how you word it, you want the small side, short side, low side, minor side, lesser side against the stationary jaw with the pin in it. Okay. All right, let's move on. After spending some time with a file and a little bit of blast work, I think I have the bosses clean to the point where they're going to be manageable. Using a drop indicator on a surface plate, I measured from the outside surface to the top of the diameter on both sides, on both ends. And these are the values I came up with. 90 here, 93 here, so a 3,000 shift would put this right on center. 94 and 87. So a 7 thou shift would put this on center. But you can't have 7 off of one end and 4 off the other end, 3 off the other end, and expect this thing to still be parallel. So you have to have a happy medium somewhere. I'm thinking if I take 4 off of this side, I'll have 89 and 90, and 4 off of this side would be 90 and 87. Close, but not exactly right in the middle. So I think I'm going to go with 5. This is going to turn to 88. This will be 90. That's a thou off center. This will be 89. This will be 87. That's also a thou off center. So five it is. Five off of this side. And then we can start bringing it into dimension symmetrically. There you go. Put it back in the machine. Chop it up. Now at this point I can start bringing these sides into required dimension of 500 and the lug on the end should stay central if I take equal amounts off of both sides. With the part now registering on the parallel sides that were just established, I'm going to sweep the jaws and come up with a center line. And yes, I set this off camera. I didn't get that lucky on the first try. Okay, zero for the center line and all the moves from this point on be symmetrical. I'm looking just to establish flat rails on what will ultimately become the bottom of the dovetail. There are center line dimensions given to the center of the boss in relationship to these two surfaces. So initially when I clean this up I just want to barely touch this. I'd rather not touch it at all if I don't have to but like I said I can always clean that up in the end. I'm just going to clean these up just to establish a clean surface so that I can flip it and hold it eh, probably on skinny parallels and establish the top deck and then I can bring the center line in that's given to the center of the bosses this way. Let's do it. With the part now resting on the surfaces that I just established using a set of extremely thin parallels, I'm going to use a fly cutter to establish the top face. 
The reason I'm using a fly cutter is because I want a very narrow cut. Uh, with a smaller diameter cutter, you're going to have a tendency to have more surface contact, more scallop in the part. Larger diameter will leave a more straight line. And with the front and rear of the fly cutter with the diameter set longer than the part, only the leading edge of the fly cutter needs to pass over the part. This should give a very fine finish on the top. With the part nested in aluminum jaws and the ends exposed, it was easy to bring in the overall length and the required height of the boss on the large side. Next feature we're going to address will be the T-slot on the top of the table. That is up here. And i got to tell you, there's some inclusions here that's just breaking my heart. I may actually grab a piece of aluminum, file it until I have a pile of debris, mix it with some glue and smear it on and regrain it and see if I can get that out. But it is the top of the table and if you're going to have uglies on any part of a machine tool, chances are it's going to be on the top of the table, right? So we'll leave it there for now. Dimensions not critical but fragile. The 125 typical is to the center of the slot on either end. The slot is called out as an eighth of an inch wide. Now that really doesn't matter right here. So long as whatever T-nut you decide to make will fit in there as you slide it all the way to the end you need to be able to lift it out so if you have a 135 long t-nut and this is only 125 well guess what it's not going in it's not coming out and if it didn't go in then it wouldn't have to worry about coming out all right now that we got that worked out t-slots are always called out like this this is a very common t-slot you're going to find on these pm research models now i am not a fan of this configuration because okay let's get into the real technical stuff here there we go let's draw a t-slot here for a second where are the working surfaces of this t-slot this is pretty much a guide surface here so the t-slot or the t-nut doesn't bounce back and forth but when you tighten down whatever you're tightening down these are the working surfaces right here the t-nut draws up so do you have to kill yourself to make sure it's a flat bottom absolutely not i will always when i make a t-slot i will always go deeper with the center in line with the top opening so that when i load up my cutter it's only loaded up right there on the edge if it's loaded up on the bottom as well, on a cutter this size, it really does make a difference. Because this diameter right here, or excuse me, it's, the, it's a distance, it's not a diameter. But this will ultimately translate to the diameter of the tool that you're going to use. In 075, that's not even 2 millimeters, that's kind of small. That's just over a sixteenth of an inch if you're a Imperial or Yankee or whatever you want to call it. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create the end slots on this part. I'll create the end canals. I will put a groove down the center. This is called out as 125 deep. I will probably go 135 to here. It doesn't matter if it's 132, 135, whatever. So long as when the cutter, the T-slot cutter engages, it's only cutting on the very edge. That'll reduce the risk of snapping that off. Absolutely. That's the plan. Let's pop it in the machine and make that happen.
Okay guys, the next step in line is the actual undercut to form the T slot. This is a very tedious little procedure because the width of the contact on the T slot is the same as the shank diameter on the tool. And that is just to allow it to go down in the slot that was previously machined in. I opened up this slot to use a 172 screw instead of the 080 T nuts that it was probably intended to use. But I just wanted to be able to use the existing hardware that I have. This is going to take a while. I'm going to wind it up. I'm going to have to make two passes, maybe even four up and back. And I'm going to raise the tool up 5,000 to give me the adequate uh, thickness of the slot, adequate vertical dimensional thickness. And we'll go from there. Here we go. The only thing that I will have to deburr by hand is the very top of the slot on the inside. You can see the little furry line reflecting the light just below the chamfer. Yep. My guess is both sides. Yes, sir, both sides. That is from when I raised the tool 5000 and took the additional cut. And I'm sure that's a very superficial burr. I will stick a piece of 220 emery in there at a diagonal and wipe it down. And I'll also try to get all these little defects out on the end. Not defects, but little burrs that are kicked out from the rotation of the cutter. Now, as far as the deep burring is concerned, if you take a slot, if you make a slot with a smaller cutter and you want to go in there with a larger deep burring tool, track the deep burring tool on the exact same center points as the slot or pocket that you just milled. So use those same coordinates for the deburring tool, but adjust the size of the chamfer by coming up or down. That will give you the desired effect, the break edge on the corners, the break edge on the slots that you are looking for. All right, let me wipe this down and pop up. <laughs> let me stick the emery in there and I'll come back and show you how easy that came off. This is an 080 T nut. This is really small. This is about a millimeter and a half in diameter. And this is smaller than the one that I'm going to put in here. I'm going to put the next size up in here. But the T nut body itself is going to be just about the same size. So let's go for the fit. And you can see that that inner burr is gone. That was 
worked out really well. <laughs> I was just always amazed at how small this stuff is. That is nice and smooth. The nut that goes in there will be a little bit wider at the top to accommodate a larger screw, and that'll take out some of this side play. It'll be a little bit wider at the bottom as well, so it'll be a little bit more snug than that. This is much smaller than it should be. Very much smaller than it will be. Seen one T slot, you've seen them all. So there's another one to go in here. It goes in the front over here. I'm not going to bore you with that one, but I will come back for the dovetail and the drilling of the end features. Got a nice little setup for that to keep that dead center. All right, stick around. This will be the setup for the drilling of that particular part. And I'm going to call this one a wrap, guys. This has gone long enough. And I'm going to finish this part up in the next video. Please come back. Check it out for the dovetails and the fit on the table or the fit on the knee. Let's see how everything goes. Thank you very much for watching. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you're well and happy and safe. All of the above. I am Joe Pye, Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. I'm out.